So uh, welcome everyone and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Gabby Goldberg. Uh, Gabby did her PhD with Richard Boyd um, at Monash on thymic development and followed that up with several postdocs in the US working on uh, bone marrow transplantation and cancer immunotherapy at uh, uh, Sloan Kettering and then at Baylor. She returned a few years ago to join us working on the uh, role of GCSF and, and uh, inflammatory diseases. And um, that project's formed the basis of a, of a very productive collaboration between uh, WeHi that involved uh, Murigen and uh, CSL. Um, and the main aspect of that has been around um, rheumatoid arthritis and Gabby's been heavily involved in that aspect of the project. But she's also been able to continue another um, related project um, in inflammatory eye disease. And this was initially started by Anne Cornish um, a few years back uh, in the lab, but Gabby's been able to uh, continue that project and, and help see it through. And she's gonna tell us about that today. So thanks, Gabby. Hi, so as Ian said, my name's Gabby Goldberg. I work in Ian's lab in the inflammation division here, and this project is a long-standing collaboration with CSL. Today I'll talk to you about the role of GCSF and neutrophils in a mouse model of uveitis, which is traditionally thought of as a T-cell mediated disease. First, I will give you some background about both uveitis and GCSF. I'll move on to neutrophils and GCSF in experimental autoimmune uveitis, which I'll refer to as EAU. We'll then look at EAU following GCSF antagonism and in the GCSF knockout mice, and then the effects of GCSF on chemokine receptor expression and migration. The final part of the talk will be looking at the effects of neutrophils on T cells in EAU. And then finally, finally, we'll propose a couple of models, what we think is going on. So uveitis specifically refers to inflammation of the uvea, which is the middle layer of the eye, and it comprises the choroid, the iris, and the ciliary body. Apart from diabetes, it is the most common cause of adult blindness in the developed world. Symptoms include blurred vision, eye pain and photophobia, and complications can include cataracts, fluid within the retina, retinal detachment, and obviously most seriously vision loss. Types of uveitis can be based on the area of the eye that they affect. So anterior uveitis affects the iris and the anterior chamber. This is by far the most common form of uveitis. Intermediate uveitis affects the cells of the vitreous cavity, posterior uveitis, the retina and the choroid, and panuveitis is inflammation of all layers of the uvea. There are many infectious and non-infectious causes of uveitis. Some causes lead to specific types of uveitis, like multiple sclerosis and intermediate uveitis, whereas others, such as Betchett syndrome, can cause anterior or posterior uveitis. This is the same with infectious diseases. For example, syphilis can cause all three types of uveitis. The treatments for uveitis are similar to those used in other inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. These include corticosteroids such as dexamethasone, conventional immunosuppressive agents like cyclophosphamide or methotrexate, biologics most commonly TNF inhibitors, but also other biologics have been used with limited success, including rituximab. The problem is that all current therapies have drug-associated toxicities, and there are 30 to 40% of patients that do not respond adequately. The pathogenesis of non-infectious uveitis is largely unknown. Many forms are thought to be T-cell mediated and dependent. One of the most well-studied forms of uveitis is that that's associated with Betchett's disease. In this disease, we see ocular antigen-specific T cells that are present in the blood, most often S and retinal S antigen, and these autospecific T cells are resistant to apoptosis. 
T cell cytokines are increased in the serum, both Th1 and Th2, and there are inflammatory growth factors that are elevated in both the serum and the eye fluid, including IL-1, IL-8, IL-18, and CXCL-1 or KC. Ocular leukocyte infiltrate is a hallmark of uveitis. This is a picture of anterior uveitis, which affects both the iris and the anterior chamber. And what you can see here is the anterior of, chamber of the eye filling up with leukocytes. A major population within the leukocyte infiltrate is neutrophils. So um, neutrophils differentiate in the bone marrow. Under normal conditions, mature neutrophils exit the bone marrow into the blood um, where unless there is an inflammatory response or an infection, they undergo constitutive apoptosis. During an infection or sterile inflammation, production of neutrophils increase and the release of mature and immature blood um, neutrophils into the blood occurs. These cells are attracted to the site of infection or inflammation. First, the selectins bind the um, inflamed endothelial cells and rolling occurs, and then um, a stronger adhesion occurs when integrins are upregulated and bind endothelial receptors. Extra, extravasation occurs and they enter the site of inflammation where they can, where they can serve several functions, including phagocytosis, they can degranulate, releasing the cytotoxic contents of their granules, and they can also produce reactive, reactive oxygen species. GCSF is known to play an important role in, t in neutrophil development in the bone marrow. Um, however, less is known about GCSF at the site of inflammation. There is some anecdotal evidence where it has been shown to be increased at sites of inflammation, such as the synovial fluid um, in rheumatoid arthritis. Even less is known about the role of GCSF once the cells have left the bone marrow and enter the blood, and the role that it plays in movement into the site of infection or inflammation. GCSF has been linked to several inflammatory diseases, it's often administered to mobilise stem cells from the bone marrow into the blood prior to a stem cell transplant. Pro-inflammatory side effects of the clinical administration of GCSF include flares of rheumatoid arthritis disease flares in, and disease flares in SLE. Elevated GCSF levels have been seen, like I said, in the joint fluid and the serum of RA patients, as well as the serum of Kawasaki's disease patients. In rodent models, administration of GCSF has been shown to exacerbate inflammatory arthritis, and work done previously in the Wix lab has shown that GCSF antagonism decreases the incidence and severity of mouse models of arthritis. Little is known about uveitis and GCSF and the role of neutrophils, but there are some indicators that it may be involved. So GCSF is increased in the serum and the vitreous humour, and neutrophils, as I said before, are a major population in the ocular leukocyte infiltrate. GCSF receptor mRNA is increased in whole eye extract of murine models of uveitis. So this brings us to the questions that we wanted to answer with this study, and they are, do neutrophils play a role in the pathogenesis of uveitis? What is the contribution of GCSF? And could GCSF be a new therapeutic target for uveitis? The mouse model of uveitis that we'll be using is a peptide-induced model, and it's a model of posterior uveitis. So it's known as EAU, and EAU is induced by injecting an IRBP peptide along with CFA subcutaneously, and at the same time, pertussis is injected IP, and this is to break down the blood-brain barrier. So over here on the right, you can see an H&E section of, a, of an eye that, um, 21 days after uveitis induction. And what you can see is that, the, well, and, and the clinical man manifestations are shown here. You can see that there's infiltrate into the aqueous humour, there's inflammation of the ciliary body, vasculitis, um, these retinal folds, 
infiltrate into the vitreous humour, retinal damage as well as retinal detachment. And these are remarkably similar to those symptoms, uh, th those seen in clinical human uveitis. It is these symptoms, it is these um, hallmarks of uveitis that we'll be using to determine the grade of severity of disease throughout the presentation. So quite a lot is known about the immunology of IRPP-induced EAU. Um, but the vast majority of it has to do with T cells. So traditionally, it is considered a T cell mediated and dependent disease. Th1 and or Th17 cells can mediate EAU. IL-23 is essential for EAU induction and pathogenesis. So P19 knockout mice, a subunit of IL-23, do not develop EAU and anti-IL-23 treatment prevents but does not reverse EAU. And um, just to let you know here, the immune cells that are seen within the eye in established EAU include T cells, neutrophils, resident macrophages and inflammatory macrophages. There are small populations of dendritic cells and B cells as well. So the first question that we wanted to ask was, are neutrophil numbers and GCSF concentration altered over the course of EAU. So we induced EAU in wild type mice and then measured several um, things in the blood and the eye at time points throughout the course of EAU, EAU. In the blood, we did differential cell counts and measured GCSF concentration. In the eye, we took serum directly from the eye, I'm uh, sorry, fluid directly from the eye and we measured GCSF concentration, but also MPO concentration as a surrogate marker for the presence of neutrophils. So here up in the top left, um, you can see white blood cell, the white blood cell uh, composition throughout the course of EAU. In the black bars are total white blood cells, in the gray, lymphocytes, and in the white, neutrophils. And so overall, the blood cells rise and remain elevated throughout the course of EAU. Looking at the grey bars, the lymphocytes, they increase early in disease but return to baseline levels within a week. But however, if you look at the white bars, you can see that neutrophils are elevated early in disease and remain elevated throughout the course of EAU to day 21. This second graph shows the concentration of GCSF on the left and the number of neutrophils on the right. And you can see that they overlap nearly exactly. So both GCSF and neutrophil number increase early in disease and remain elevated to day 21 after induction. Moving to within the eye, looking at GCSF on the left and MPO or the presence of neutrophils on the right, you can see that both of these increase to day 21 after disease induction. Because both neutrophils and GCSF were elevated throughout EAU, we wanted to analyse the effect of the absence of GCSF on the severity of disease. So we induced EAU in black six mice and GCSF knockout mice. On day 21, the disease severity was scored using H&E histology, um, and then we also analysed the hematopoietic infiltrate of the eye by flow cytometry. So here you can see the, um, these sections were scored for disease severity by Anne Cornish with the help of Lindell Lim from the Iron Ear Hospital, she's an ophthalmologist, and what can be seen here is that there's a decrease in disease severity in the GCSF knockout mice. And that can be seen here. So this is EAU wild type mice 21 days after disease induction and we can see the retinal folds and the infiltrate into the vitreous humour and also retinal detachment. Whereas in the GCSF knockout mice, this section looks remarkably like uh, an eye where disease was never induced. <coughs> 
Another way to assess the severity of EAU is by looking at IRBP degradation. So the more degradation that occurs, the more severe the disease. And so what can be seen here is that IRBP is significantly degraded in the wild type mice compared to both the naive mice and the GCSF knockout EAU mice. And this is just represented graphically here where you can see that there's a marked decrease in IRBP in the wild type mice and GCSF. There's actually no difference between the GCSF knockouts and the naive black six mice. So in order to better understand the reason for these differences, we decided to analyse the infiltrate of the eye by flow cytometry. And by far the most striking difference that we saw was the near absence of neutrophil infiltrate into the eye in GCSF knockout mice. We graphed this and showed that there was a marked decrease in both proportion and number of neutrophils in the GCSF knockouts 21 days into EAU. And this can't be accounted for the decrease in circulating neutrophils alone. In general, we saw about 60% neutrophils within the wild type EAU mice and about 30% neutrophils within the EAU mice. And whereas we see a more than 20 fold reduction in the proportion of neutrophils within the eye. We compared this to other populations within the eye, including resident macrophages and inflammatory macrophages. And what can be seen quite clearly here is that there's no difference in proportion or number in either of these populations when comparing the wild type and the GCSF knockout mice. We induced EAU in black six mice and injected either an anti-GCSF or an isotype control monoclonal antibody. We did this for a number of reasons. Firstly, because it's a more clinically applicable model, but also to ensure that the differences that we've just seen weren't due to developmental defects in the GCSF knockout mouse neutrophils. So here again, we assessed disease severity by histology and then analysed the infiltrate into the eye by flow cytometry. Again, we saw a decrease following anti-GCSF treatment in, um, and this is represented here in the H&E sections where we see the retinal folds and the infiltrate into the vitreous humour. And then again, these anti, the anti-GCSF treated mice uh, largely um, look like the um, wild type mice where the disease was not induced. We saw a decrease in the in neutrophil infiltrate into the eye in the anti-GCSF mice compared to the isotype treated mice. This is represented graphically here as both proportion and number. Because there was a slightly bigger population of neutrophils within the anti-GCSF treated mice compared to the GCSF knockouts, we were actually able to analyse them for, act, for their activation state. We chose to look at two markers, CD62L and CD11B. So activated neutrophils have a phenotype where they express low levels of CD62L and high levels of CD11B. And this is exactly what can be seen in the neutrophils from the isotype treated mice they have an activated phenotype within the eye. However, if we look at the neutrophils from the anti-GCSF treated mice, we see that they're expressing relatively high levels of CD62L and low levels of CD11B. So this is quite a naive phenotype. So not only uh, is there a decrease in the mig migration of neutrophils from the blood into the eye, there appears to be an defect in activation as well, which would most likely lead to a defect in function. <coughs> and just for completion, what we can see here is that if we looked at the circulating neutrophils and looked at the expression of CD62L and 11B, this difference within the eye does not appear um, within the circulating neutrophils. So there's no difference in the activation state of these neutrophils. 
In order to further analyse the severity of EAU in the anti-GCSF treated mice, we used a micron retinal imaging system. So these experiments were done with our collaborators at Monash University and it's, it's their equipment. And what we did is the mice were anaesthetised and images were taken directly through the eye. So this is a way of being able to assess disease severity throughout the course of disease without actually having to kill the mice at each time point. So in this first section, we'll only be looking at the bright field microscopy and using it to analyse disease severity. Later in the talk, we'll be looking at the fluorescence. Um, the mice were actually Lys M. Cree EGFP mice, so they expressed the EGFP at the highest levels on neutrophils, but I'll talk about this more later in the talk. So here this is looking at day 14 of EAU. The top eye um, is just a black six mouse. There's no EAU and no monoclonal antibody treatment. The second eye is um, EAU was induced, an isotype antibody was given, and the bottom there was um, is... EAU was induced and anti-GCSF was given. So at day 14, you can see commencement of patchy perivasculitis, which appears as these white strokes along the blood vessels. There's a few areas of focal infiltrate and there's a mild vitreous haze. At day 21, you can see that the changes are a lot more obvious and a lot more obvious in the isotype treated mice. So there's widespread retinal edema, extensive retinal folds, focal granulomas, and quite severe perivasculitis. And um, as I said, that it doesn't appear to be as severe in the anti-GCSF treated mice. Our collaborators at Monash scored these sections or scored these images for disease severity and what can be seen is that at day 14 both the isotype treated mice and the anti-GCSF treated mice had mild disease. This progressed to quite moderately severe disease in the isotype treated animals but disease did not progress in the anti-GCSF treated mice. So in summary of this first section Neutrophils and GCSF are increased throughout the course of EAU. In the absence of GCSF, we see a decrease in the severity of disease and a decrease in neutrophil proportion, number and activation state. We wanted to understand why neutrophils were unable to get into the eye. So we decided to analyse two of the markers that are best known to have a role in neutrophil migration. These are two chemokine receptors, CXCR4 and CXCR2. And the relationship between GCSF and CXCR4 and 2 is largely understood within the bone marrow. So in the steady state, the ligand for CXCR4, CXCL, the CXCL12 or SCF1, is produced in large amounts. This is known to retain neutrophils within the bone marrow. And in the steady state, in the bone marrow, um, in the, bone marrow the neutrophils express high levels of CXCR4. Reciprocally, they express intermediate or low levels of CXCR2, and only a small amount of the CXCR2 ligands uh, ligand CXCL1 and CXCL2, which are KC and MIP2, are present within the bone marrow in this state. However, during emergency granular poesis, where we see an increase of GCSF, we see a decrease in CXCL12 and a decrease in CXCR4, so decreasing the retention signals of neutrophils in the bone marrow, and we see an increase in the expression of CXCR2 and an increase in its ligands, so increasing the release signals of um, neutrophils. So in emergency granular poesis, we see an increase in um, export of neutrophils from the bone marrow. <coughs> 
How, while this is relatively well understood, it's important for our story to know that very little is known about the GCSF CXCR2 and CXCR4 axis on circulating neutrophils once they've left the bone marrow and whether this plays a role in um, neutrophil migration into the sites of inflammation. So we started by looking at the expression of these chemokine receptors on neutrophils in the bone marrow and the blood. And what can be seen here is that CXCR4 is, sorry, and this is on wild type GCSF knockout and GCSF receptor knockout mice. And you can see that the mean fluorescence intensity is increased on the um, neutrophils within the bone marrow in the GCSF and GCSF receptor knockouts as well as the blood. So the retention signals within the bone marrow are increased. And with CXCR2, we see a decrease in the expression of CXCR2 on peripheral neutrophils in this steady state. We also wanted to see if these, these chemokine receptors were affected in EAU. So EAU was induced in the B6 and the knockout mice. And at day 21, we looked in both the bone marrow and the blood. And here in the bone marrow, what you can see is an increase in CXCR4, the retention signal in the GCSF knockouts, and a decrease in CXCR2. And in the blood, the same was seen. So we saw an increased expression of CXCR4 in the GCSF knockouts and a decrease in CX, sorry, yeah, and a decrease in CXCR2. We also did these experiments using anti-GCSF and we saw a very similar pattern. So overall here you can see that CXCR4, the expression is increased in the GCSF knockouts or following anti-GCSF treatment. And the, in, with CXCR2, overall CXCR2 is decreased in the GCSF knockouts or following administration of anti-GCSF. So as I said before, little is known about the effects of GCSF on peripheral neutrophils. And so in order to establish that the differences that we're seeing are actually due to GCSF acting on peripheral neutrophils instead of acting on neutrophils within the bone marrow and then the neutrophils being exported, we stimulated peripheral neutrophil neutrophils in vitro. So here what you can see is baseline levels of CXCR4 and CXCR2 on neutrophils. So CXCR4 on peripheral neutrophils is relatively low and CXCR2 is relatively high. And if we culture them for six hours with no form of stimulation, you can see that there's a significant increase in CXCR4 and a decrease in CXCR2. And it's important to note that these cells are actually gated on a Nexon 5 negative and a viability dye negative um, population of cells because we wanted to make sure that we weren't just capturing the dead and dying cells within the culture. If we add GCSF to the culture, you can see here that CXCR4 is not upregulated and not only is CXCR2 not downregulated, but it's actually significantly upregulated on the surface of neutrophils. Here we compared this to GMCSF, where we see that GMCSF, um, in GMCSF stimulated neutrophils upregulate CXCR4 in a similar way to those that are unstimulated. However, with respect to CXCR2, they don't seem to downregulate CXCR2. However, there's not the increase that we see with GCSF. So here what we can see is that GCSF maintains low levels of CXCR4 expression and increases CXCR2 expression on circulating neutrophils. So just to add to the summary, what I've shown you in this section overall is that in the absence of GCSF, CXCR4 is increased and CXCR2 is decreased on, um, on neutrophils. <coughs> 
So the next question that we wanted to ask was, do the changes in CXCR2 expression lead to changes in neutrophil migration? So CXCR2 is known to play a role in the migration of neutrophils from the blood to the sites of inflammation in several disease models. Um, just to give you a little bit more information, CXCR2 is the receptor for KC or CXCL1, MIP2 or CXCR2, and in humans, IL-8 or CXCL8. So, sorry if the specifics of this picture aren't great, but it's, it's just not fantastic quality, so if I blow it up, it becomes even less clear. But the things that you need to take away from it are that neutrophils respond to chemotactic si signals by, um, and several events occur. One of the first things that occurs is actin filament polymerization. There's an increase in chemokine receptor expression on the cell overall, and there's a specific redistribution of the receptors to the anterior or leading pole of the neutrophil. We looked at neutrophil migration in several ways. So the first way that we looked at it was using a traditional transwell migration assay. So EAU was induced in mice and they received either the isotype or the anti-GCSF monoclonal antibody. At day 21, neutrophils were isolated and then we used the transwell system where a chemoattractant is put in the bottom chamber and the cells are put in the top chamber. It's incubated for an amount of time. Here we use a relatively short amount of time, 30 minutes, um, and then you can measure migration through to the bottom chamber towards the chemoattractant. <clears throat> so here we've used MIP2 or CXCL2, which is one of the ligands for CXCR2. And what can be seen is that the isotype treated neutrophils um, that are um, were cultured with MIP2, migrated towards MIP2 relatively well in both the blood, in the spleen and the blood. However, those neutrophils isolated from anti-GCSF treated mice did not migrate towards the MIP2 in the spleen and the migration was decreased in the um, blood. As um, I said before, actin polymerization is a, an important part of neutrophil movement. And so we used an assay which took advantage of the fact that phalloidin binds F-actin. So EAU was induced at day 21. In this case, we stained the cells for neutrophil markers and then we exposed them to MIP2 or CXCL2 for very short periods of time. The cells were fixed and permeabilized and then stained with phalloidin, a fluorescently labeled phalloidin. And this is a flow cytometric assay. And so what can be seen here is that neutrophils from the isotype treated mice underwent actin polymerization as expected. However, the neutrophils from the, in the neutrophils from the anti-GCSF treated mice, actin polymerization was reduced. We wanted to know if these changes that we saw in, vi in in vitro migration actually translated to a decrease in, vi in, in, in vivo migration. So we, sorry, we, um, we took GCSF knockouts and GCSF receptor knockouts and injected GCSF one day prior to injecting either PBS or MIP2. We then analysed the peripheral blood for neutrophils and the expression of CXCR2, and we did a peritoneal lavage to look at neutrophil migration in vivo. So if you just concentrate here on the left graph, you can see that in the GCSF knockout mice, we see what we expected this, that we saw before, this increase in CXCR2 expression. This increase wasn't seen in the GCSF receptor knockouts. And then here, looking at migration, what we see is that this increase in CXCR2 expression leads to an increase in the migration of neutrophils in the GCSF knockouts. And this is not seen in the GCSF receptor knockouts where we don't see the increase in CXCR2.
We next use the micron retinal imaging system again. And as I said before, um, we induced EAE in lyse M Cree mice. So these mice express EGFP on neutrophils more brightly than any other cell. And we were able to look at neutrophil infiltrate into the eye at day 14 and day 21 after disease induction. So here at day 14, you can see in both the isotype treated mice and the anti-GCSF treated mice that the vast majority of the neutrophils are surrounding the optic nerve and there are very few other cells within the eye, but there are some in the tissue and some within the blood vessels, but there doesn't appear to be a large difference. However, at day 21, what can be seen in the isotype treated mice that with EAU, you can see neutrophils infiltrating the eye and they're throughout the tissue. They're still around the optic nerve and they're also in the blood vessels. But what can be seen here in the anti-GCSF treated mice is that the neutrophils here are largely trapped within the blood vessels of the eye. So with the help of Lockie from imaging, we were able to calculate the mean fluorescence within the eyes. And what can be seen here is that we see a decrease in the total mean fluorescence at day 14. But then because we saw such bright fluorescence in the optic nerve, we decided to look at the fluorescence within this area and then actually look at the tissue and the blood vessels separate from that to see if we could um, reveal something going on. And so if we looked at the area minus the optic nerve, what we can see is we see a decrease in the mean fluorescence at both day 14 and day 21. And if we looked at the optic nerve alone, we see a large decrease in the, optic, the neutrophils around the optic nerve area in the anti-GCSF treated mice. So in summary of this section, what we see is that decreased CXCR2 expression on neutrophils leads to reduced migration both in vitro and in vivo. So up until now, we've discussed neutrophils and GCSF within EAU, but I told you at the beginning of the talk that EAU is thought to be a T cell mediated disease. So, and just to remind you, it's been shown that it can be either mediated by Th1 or Th17 cells. So we wanted to know whether the T cell response to EA, in EAU is perturbed in the GCSF knockout mice. The specific questions we wanted to ask were, were does the decrease in neutrophils decrease the proliferative response of antigen specific T, T cells? Is there a decrease in the number of T cells? And does the decrease in neutrophil skew the cytokine production by T cells within the eye? So firstly, we looked at splenic T cell proliferation. And we, so this is at day 21. Um, after EAU induction, we took splenic T cells. We labelled them with a fluorescent dye and we stimulated them with PMA as a positive control the IRBP peptide that we use to um, induce disease or no peptide. And then five days, these were cultured for five days and then stained for CD3, CD4 and a viability dye. And so what you can see here as just an example, we saw proliferation to PMA, which leads to a decrease in the fluorescence of the cells. With no IRBP, we saw very little proliferation and with IRBP we saw the antigen specific proliferation of the T cells and this is graphed over here and what can be seen looking at the wild type T cells in white and the GCSF knockout T cells in black is that there doesn't appear to be a defect in the proliferation in the GCSF knockout mice. So as I said TH17 cells are thought to play a role in this model so we wanted to look at the levels of IL-17A in the GCSF knockout mice. And so what we did is we induced disease and then 
we took eye fluid and serum and looked at IL-17A levels. And quite surprisingly, we saw the opposite of what we expected and we saw an increase in IL-17 in the serum throughout the course of EAU and we saw an increase in IL-17 in the eye at day 21. So in order to analyse this further, we, want, we wanted to look at T cell cytokine, the, the production of T, um, cytokines by T cells within the eye. So we induced EAU, we made single cell suspensions of the eye at day 21, the whole eye was stimulated for four hours with PMA and inomycin. We surface stained for T cell markers and then we did intracellular staining. And here you can see staining of T cells from within the eye and we can see multiple cytokines being produced by the cells within the eye. So just firstly, um, we looked at both the proportion and number of T cells and you can see here in the white, the wild type, and the black, the GCSF EAU mice, there is no difference in the, num the proportion or number of T cells or CD4 T cells in the EAU mice. So in order to decide which cytokines we were going to look at within the eye, we were, we were very limited because you can do one intracellular stain per mouse for each of these um, experiments. So we really wanted to figure out which cytokines were best to analyse. And so we actually went to the literature and looked at a model where the cytokine production is better understood, and this is a mouse model of MS, EAE. And so there are... A, two recent publications which would give us clues as to which cytokines we should be looking for. The first one showed that if you stimulate T cells with IL-23, they differentiate into Th17 cells producing both IL-17 and GMCSF. If you inject these cells back into a mouse, they develop EAE. If you stimulate T cells with other cytokines, here they used IL-1 and TGF-beta that also lead to the differentiation of Th17 cells. These cells produce IL-17 but they do not produce GMCSF. When these cells are transferred back into a mouse, they do not develop EAE. So in the presence of IL-23, Th17 cells produce GMCSF and are pathogenic. The next paper, which came out only earlier this year, actually looked at the T cells within the CNS in an EAE mouse. And firstly, they analysed them for MOG specificity, and this is the target antigen in the EAE model. And what they found was those cells producing both inter um, IL-17A and interferon gamma had a much higher proportion of MOG-specific T cells than those expressing IL-17A, interferon alone, or neither of the cytokines. They then went on to actually isolate the IL-17A producing cells or IL-17A and interferon gamma double producing cells. This was a double reporter mouse. And what they showed was whether they stimulated either of these populations with or without IL-23, they got different results. So stimulating either of these um, populations in the absence of IL-23 led to Th17 cells that produced IL-17 alone. If it was stimulated in the presence of IL-23, this led to um, the differentiation or the presence of Th17 cells producing both IL-17A and interferon gamma. And so what, these, what this model showed was that it was the interferon gamma Th17 cells that are enriched for antigen-specific cells, and it was these cells that were produced in the presence of IL-23. So because of these two studies, we went on to look at the expression of GMCSF interferon gamma and IL-17 within the, by the 
T cells from within the eye. And what we've found here is that this is looking at the proportion and we see a decrease in the proportion of cells that produce interferon gamma alone and GMCSF alone and also the interferon gamma and IL-17 double producing cells. And just to remind you, these graphs that are boxed in red um, represent the, pro the populations that I just described to you in the models of EAE. So decreases can be seen in the T cell populations that are thought to be pathogenic in EAE. We then looked at the number of these cells from within the eye and you can see again we see this decrease in the interferon gamma alone producing T cells, the GMCSF alone producing T cells and the, in the interferon gamma IL-17 producing T cells and the GMCSF and interferon gamma producing T cells. And again, it's these populations in red that are thought to be pathogenic in the EAE model. So to add to the summary here, what we showed was that antigen-specific T cell proliferation is unaffected. However, some of the populations that have been identified as pathogenic within EAE are reduced in the EAU eyes, in the GCSF knockout mice. So just as an overall summary of the project so far, neutrophils and GCSF are increased throughout EAU. In the absence of GCSF, EAU is decreased in severity. Neutrophil proportions and numbers are decreased within the eye. CXCR4 is increased and CXCR2 is decreased on the surface of neutrophils. The decrease in CXCR2 on neutrophils leads to a defect in the migration of neutrophils, both in vitro and in vivo. The antigen-specific T cell proliferation appears unaffected. However, the T cell populations identified as pathogenic within EAE are reduced in the absence of GCSF. So we believe that this data suggests that GCSF may represent a new therapeutic target in uveitis. And just to explain to you a couple of models of what we believe is happening. So in EAU, you have GCSF binding the GCSF receptor, which increases the function of neutrophils. It increases degranulation, um, superoxide production, as well as cytokine and chemokine production. This can lead to the recruitment of other neutrophils and oh, well, of neutrophils and other immune cells, and it can actually cause tissue damage directly. And this tissue damage is actually thought to release the sequestered antigens and allow the T cell mediated immunity to occur. So in the absence of GCSF, we see a decrease in the function of neutrophils at the site of inflammation which would decrease the recruitment of other immune cells and decrease tissue damage. And so while we believe that this is occurring, it's the most simple explanation, we believe that it now isn't thorough enough to explain some of our findings. For example, it doesn't account for the differences that we see in T cell cytokine production. So we have hypothesised that this model becomes more complex and this is based on some early preliminary data that we have which is the next stage of our story. So what we're suggesting is GCSF binds the GCSF receptor and neutrophils produce a growth factor, possibly IL-1. It acts on inflammatory dendritic cells and macrophages increasing the production of IL-23 which acts on T, T helper cells and increases the differentiation into Th17 cells that are producing either interferon gamma and or GMCSF. So in the absence of GCSF, we would see a decrease in the production of IL-23 and a decrease in the production of interferon gamma and GMCSF by the Th17 cells. So um, just to let you know where we're going with this project, we're currently working very hard trying to elucidate the mechanisms by which 
GCSF and neutrophils shape the T cell immune response in this model of autoimmunity. We have several human studies underway looking at the role of neutrophils in inflammatory disease, including uh, a study looking at the number, phenotype and function of neutrophils in inflammatory disease. Um, we're also looking at transcriptional profiling, looking for a GCSF signature, and also comparing healthy donor and patient neutrophils, and finally also comparing neutrophils from the blood and neutrophils isolated from the site of inflammation. Um, CSL has developed a fully human anti-GCSF receptor monoclonal antibody for human use. It has undergone testing in several non-human primate studies and is currently being tested in human in vitro assays. So this just leaves thanking everybody involved in the project. Um, obviously Ian, but also a special thank you to Anne Cornish that did some of the early work in this project, and Jane and Ishan. Um, Lockie helped with the fluorescence um, microscopy, and um, Peter and Cheshire made um, a lot of the diagrams and photos. Um, and then I'd also like to thank the group at CSL and Paul and Xing Tang at Monash and Lindell for helping us score the disease severity. And then the funding sources, this um, is funded by CSL. It was originally funded by Mirogen and we've received a grant from Aurea and my fellowship is an NH and MRC fellowship. Thanks. Um, yes, and would you believe <laughs> it's the only spare slide I have. <laughs> so yeah, so I just thought I'd show you that. But um, yeah, so they have. There's some indication that neutrophils can actually cause damage directly. So they produce the um, ROS causes the peroxidation. They also release the proteolytic enzymes, which damage a lot of the elastins and collagen within the other cells and they believe that that's what causes a lot of the damage. Um, and there's several studies that have been shown that they can cause damage directly. Great. I've been asking that question for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if, so, so the autoimmune uveitis in patients is sort of a self-sustaining um, disease. Do you think that if one interrupted the mechanism by inhibiting I believe it would have to be a continual treatment. I mean, it, it depends on the trigger, right? So if, if the trigger is continually there, then you would think it would have to be a continual treatment. I mean, if we remove treatment, we definitely see improvement for a long time, but then disease will come back. Yeah. It's relapsing, you know, remitting more than. You know, it relapses, yeah. and, and the big concern is uh, you know, loss of permanent loss of vision. So, so the acute episode. So, so one um, idea, I guess, would be that something, an approach like this, might um, improve treatment of an acute, severe uh, relapse like that and allow you to get uh, better disease control. Um, but, uh, I mean, obviously, it'd be interesting to model that experimentally by adjusting when you intervened in this model with an anti-GCSF on an antibody and just compare the effect at different stages. But you might imagine that it would be most effective early on in you know, the disease. That's the sort sort of patient that Gabby showed you where the anterior chamber was, was swimming with uh, neutrons. Yep. Thanks, Gabby. It's an interesting model. The time delay was quite interesting that day 21 uh, was the time frame which developed the uveitis. 
as well as the GCS set, the concentration is increasing in the eye. Uh, so the two questions are, what do you think the local uh, uh, source of the GCS set is? And the second one is, do you think an intraocular uh, administration of any GCS set antibody would be a more effective therapy? Okay. Um I think intraocular injection of anti-GCSF is a fantastic idea and I've tried it. But the problem is, is that ethically we're only allowed to give one injection. So it's really tricky to try and figure out, so we, sorry, so with humans, um, treatment of eye disease is often treated by intraocular injection and multiple injections can be given in humans. Whereas when we're looking at the mouse model, we only have ethics to give one injection. And it's really tricky to try and figure out if we give the injection, when to analyse, and whether one injection of anti-G would be enough. That's the first comment. The second comment is they've actually looked um, within the eye and, well, they were looking for several things and one of the things that they found were um, endothelial cells within the eye are able to produce um, GCSF. So, I mean, that's one of, the t one of the cell types within the eye that's known. Other than that, it's not known what cells produce it. It certainly is another option that local um, uh, injection into the eye, and that's as you know, another injection of anti-GCSF. They have. Um, well, no, sorry, they haven't. They have done the model in, they have done a, a different model of EAU in, it's an endotoxin induced model, which is also, which is thought to be neutrophil mediated um, in the CXCR2 knockout mice. So they haven't actually tested a CXCR2 antagonist. In the knockout mice, they saw a decrease in leukocyte infiltrate. That's all they reported. They didn't show whether it decreased disease severity and they didn't tell you what type of cell it was. Maybe the last question up there. Yes, so the last two models showed R1 and interferon gamma. So if you use R1 interferon gamma blockage, would you see reduction in the EU? Yeah, so a blockade in interferon gamma. And R1. Together. They've shown, all right, so IL-1, um, they've done a model where they've used very, very high doses of anakinra, and they've shown a slight decrease in the severity of disease. And with the interferon gamma, they've done it in the knockout mice, they've done it treating with anti-interferon gamma, and yes, you do see a decrease in the severity. Okay, well, it's 2 o'clock. Um, just remains to thank Gabby for a very interesting